Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the economics of uh, Terra, and in particular what really excites me as an economist uh, about the Terra project. So let me start with defining exactly what is Terra for those of you who haven't heard about it yet. Um, so Terra is really a blockchain payment network and is uh, for the growing e-commerce Asian market. In order, I want to sort of spend the next uh, 25 minutes or so about three things that uh, really excite me. A little bit telling you why and how it works as a stable coin. And in particular, I will uh, pinpoint two things uh, that I like. Uh, one is the fact that uh, sort of is uh, making my dream of becoming a central banker uh, reality, because I can finally talk about monetary policy and apply it uh, in real life. I'll uh, talk about a little bit of the fiscal policy behind the, the, the economics uh, of Terra. And then I will go into details about uh, analyzing uh, for the first time uh, some of the transaction data that we got from uh, Terra. Uh, and finally, I'm going to conclude with telling you a little bit what's, uh, what's next for us. Okay? So let me start with a little bit of motivation why I thought this was a great uh, project to join. Uh, as you all know, one big issue with the adoption of uh, cryptocurrencies uh, as a use case was price volatility, and the other one, uh, the, the need for uh, adoption uh, all over the places, uh, and the lack of real-world use cases. I will tell you how, in my opinion, uh, Terra addresses uh, both of these issues. So let me start with the price volatility. So the Terra maintains stability by adjusting money supply. So in contrast to Bitcoin, which you can see basically is uh, the first graph here where you have demand and supply, and the Bitcoin supply is completely inelastic. So as you get a shift in the demand, uh, this will basically translate in shift uh, in prices. Here in Terra, we actually can shift the supply dynamically, and it will adjust automatically to shifts uh, in the underlying uh, volume, in the underlying uh, demand. In particular, just to tell you a little bit about the mechanism, as the price of Terra increases, because for example, there has been some expansion in the underlying demand, the underlying transaction volume, uh, protocol issues more Terra. On the other hand, if the price of Terra decreases, so you are in a moment of, for example, turmoil in the market, or there is lower volume uh, underlying uh, the Terra protocol, then you have that the protocol buys back this Terra and burn it. In this way, this allows us to basically maintain uh, the stability. So in contrast to many of the other uh, um, uh, companies out there that looks at uh, stability as one of the main uh, um, objectives, we achieve that rather than with uh, fully collateralizing with reserves, we do that algorithmically with uh, this system. In particular, together with Terra, which is the stable coin, there is one more which is super important, which is Luna. Luna basically is a token that allows us to fully collateralize the underlying uh, Terra. So every time a transaction with Terra takes place, a fee is directed to Luna. And this transaction fee is dynamic, meaning that it's actually calibrated to ensure full collateralization over time. So also that one is something that uh, we put in place in order to adjust depending on the demand outside. In some sense, one way of sort of understanding uh, the underlying economics of this is that if we were worried about price volatility on the Terra side, we, ma we managed to shift most of this volatility on the Luna side. So Luna is basically absorb some of the fluctuations in the underlying uh, demand by, um, by basically collateralizing uh, Terra. And so the transaction fees are rewarded to those who stake Luna. And the value Luna is used then to basically achieve stability as well. This, uh, that, this basically opens up one interesting point, which is at the end of the day, the, the, the adjustment of the supply is used for one important thing, which is the using, uh, improving the adoption of uh, uh, Terra. The way in which we do that is because as Terra is used uh, as an e-commerce platform and the new money supply is generated, what this leads to is actually higher discounts. And higher discounts are gonna lead to higher user adoptions. I'm gonna explain this in a second, but this allows us to sort of drive uh, a virtuous cycle. The virtue cycle is between new demand for Terra. For example, think about this as a new e-commerce platform that is adopting Terra on their website. This allows us to, or demands from us, uh, an increase in the supply of Terra. And this will bring new money into the system. These new money are partially used to, uh, to, to give higher discounts to users. 
meaning that uh, one way in which we can compete against the Samsung Pay, the Apple Pay of this world is by allowing customers uh, higher discounts if they use Terra as a way of a mean of payment rather than the others. And so allowing uh, this increase in the money supply allows us to achieve higher discounts and improve basically uh, the incentives for customers to use Terra in the first place. Now, the last point uh, in terms of the mechanisms that, that I want to highlight is how the Oracle works. Uh, since most of this is basically off-chain, you need a system on the chain to, uh, to, to get a price for each one of the swaps between, price, between Terra and all the other currencies that we swap this into. So we started with the SDR, but then we have Terra against the USD dollars as well as the other currencies. So validators vote a price with a weight that is equal to their Luna stake. And the Oracle determines the price as the weighted median of the votes. And then the validators who are within one standard deviation or 1% of the weighted median vote are the ones that get rewarded. And as of now, there is no penalty for the ones that are farther away. Uh, but we put in place a system in which these rewards uh, are happening uh, over uh, an X number of blocks that depends on how much incentives uh, there is in the, in the system for uh, cheating, basically, the system. And so you can allow these depending on how big of the stake uh, there is. Now, that was sort of how to address one half of the, of the problem, which is the price volatility. Then I want to sort of explain a little bit uh, how we address the, the user adoption. So one easy way of thinking about blockchain startups versus traditional startups is that traditional startups start with a business plan, an equity raise, a consolidation of voting power among, among founders. It might not always be good, we just saw we work. And then uh, trying to uh, achieve usership growth. On the other hand, blockchain companies uh, have uh, sort of always start with a white paper, a token raise, a decentralization of ownership, and then a big emphasis on token prices. And none of, the, none of these dimensions sort of talk about uh, usership. And in fact, if you look at some of the numbers out there in terms of the app, uh, uh, the app uh, traffic is abysmal against uh, the big apps out there. Think about WhatsApp, Messenger, and the others. So how do we do this nowadays? So we are trying to compete in a tough market, which is this e-commerce uh, in Southeast Asia. And it's slightly, it's slightly different than the US. So I wasn't used to this, but in the US, most of the time you go on Amazon and you pay with your credit cards. Um, in, uh, in Asia, you can actually pay with many different uh, uh, payment systems, uh, from Alipay to Samsung Pay, Apple Pay, just to mention the biggest one. Each one of these are going to offer some discounts to customers. And so there is going to be sort of a race to attract more customers to each single one of these mino payments. So we're going to offer, I think we have an advantage in offering some of these discounts for exactly the economics that, that is behind Terra. In particular, since we are going to be trying to be pan-Asian rather than just local, we are going to try to sort of use these discounts rather than funded by balance sheet, which is the usual way in which has been done so far. We are going to use it, uh, we are going to be funded through network growth. And then one important thing is that we are also going to uh, sort of attack the other side of the network, not only the customers, but also the merchants. So while the merchants usually pay between 2.5% and 3% in average fees, we are uh, bolstering adoption because we promise a fee that is capped at 2%. In most of the cases, about 1%. And so for most of the merchants out there, there is a significant uh, save, uh, saving on each one of these uh, transactions if they adopt uh, Terra. So that sort of solves the other side of the market, which is the adoption on the uh, merchant side. And on the consumer side, we are offering exactly the same user experience that the users are used to. So they don't have to really shift in expectation and they shift in sort of what they are used to in terms of using Terra versus anything else. And in fact, the way in which it's going to work is you have Timon, for example, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, e-commerce in Korea. They're going to uh, use Terra. They are using Terra as a payment method. This connects automatically to your bank account. Then the bank account gives you the, shows up as a, uh, once you use Terra, shows up as, for example, a 10% discount on a particular transaction. And then finally, you have the transaction completed. Okay, so everything is exactly the same as it would have been with any other type of, uh, uh, of payment system. The only difference is that 
as the, under, the underlying uh, transaction volume increases, think about uh, uh, increasing, for example, 100 million through a newly added uh, e-commerce partner. We are adding uh, these uh, uh, very often, and uh, I, will talk, I will talk at the end of what's the plans for the near future. Uh, to meet this increased demand, we increase the money supply, and then with this added money supply, we are funding uh, the discounts that I just showed you before for each one of these customers. Okay. This is sort of how we address these two sizes, the price, volatility, and the user adoption. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Terra and the partnership they had with Chai, which is really the system that has been used uh, on this platform uh, to uh, implement Terra. So Chai utilized Terra blockchain, the stablecoin uh, economy, to offer these lower transaction fees for the merchants and fund these discounts for the customers. As a result, of Chai uh, growth, Terra is becoming one of the most active blockchain after Bitcoin and Ethereum. And since, think about this, since April, we have already uh, more than 450,000 uh, wallets that have been created. We now have about 66 validators who add stability and diversity to the Terra network. So Chai is really basically driving uh, the Terra transaction volume, and Terra is uh, uh, funding the marketing budget for uh, Chai on these, uh, on these platforms. So this is exactly what I showed you be before in terms of the user experience uh, with the added layer of having Chai as really the company that is using Terra as the underlying uh, blockchain uh, uh, company. Uh, one thing that I want to mention is a couple of numbers that are super important in order to understand what's really the advantage of this. So if you think about the usual, you know, the standard uh, payment systems, you have a settlement time that is between 3 and 14 days when you are lucky, and you have pretty high transaction fees, about 3%. On the other hand, we can guarantee a uh, settlement time of just 6 seconds. You have just one layer, which is the Terra blockchain, and you have transaction fees that, uh, as of now, go between 0.5% and 1.3%. Okay. Now, just to tell you some of uh, the, 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 the highlights uh, of uh, the last few months. So we have a transaction volume uh, just completed of about uh, $54 million, uh, savings of about $800,000 for merchants, and we reached uh, 500,000 consumers. Uh, users. And uh, we have already seven e-commerce platforms that have been integrating uh, Terra, uh, and we spent basically zero marketing dollars uh, from balance sheet. As a result, we exceeded one of the biggest uh, goals that we had for the fixed six, six months, which was achieving at least 10% of Timon market share. The interesting thing is that most of this market share is actually taken from credit card users which really speaks to what are the frictions in that market. So most of the frictions are really by the fact that there are these, the fees that the credit card companies are paying are all are way too high, and, uh, and Terra is providing an alternative, a, success, a successful uh, alternative to that. Um, I'm gonna talk about this uh, later on, but one thing that I wanna mention is that uh, the e-commerce are just uh, the first step. Uh, we're gonna launch uh, in the next couple of months uh, a partnership with the CU, Think about the 7-Eleven, uh, which has more than 40,000 uh, locations, and we expect the transaction volume to continue to grow at three times uh, uh, what's the, the, the run rate of 375 million that it is today. Now, this is sort of a little bit of the theory and how we got here and, and some of the initial results, but what really excites me as an empirical guy, mostly, is actually looking at the data. So for once, we can actually see what's happening and what the users are doing with the underlying uh, uh, technology. So we analyzed uh, a, the first batch of transactions. Uh, we're talking about 1.2 million transactions in the first three months. I want to present some of the takeaways. Uh, uh, we sort of split these uh, to sort of understand a little bit more uh, uh, about our sort of customers, clientele, and what we can do better uh, in the next few months. So as I said, it's 1.2 million transactions. Uh, starts in uh, June uh, 2019 up to September 1st. And this is across more than 300,000 uh, single user users. We have information not only about their transactions, but also some demographics about these users. For example, the gender, the user age, and also what, obviously what they, uh, what they bought in terms of purchase amounts, the discounts, whether they canceled some of these transactions or not. So first of all, what are the summary stats? So I'm gonna talk about all of these about uh, Korean won, but the average order is about 21,000 Korean won, I think about 20 bucks or so. 
And after uh, factoring in some of the, of the cancellation and the discounts of uh, 18 uh, Korean won and the merchant discounts, we arrive at an average of 18.5 thousand. Okay? So this is sort of the, sort of the gross uh, transaction price. And then you subtract uh, all the different discounts that are offered by the merchant as well as by Chai directly. And some of the cancellation, you get an average uh, uh, payment uh, by these users, which is, uh, as I said, around $20 uh, per uh, transaction. Now, the interesting part is also looking at whether this is used uh, multiple times, so this is uh, uh, used once and then uh, forgotten. And what we can see is that uh, roughly half of the users make uh, one transaction during this data set. I think that we are sort of biasing, uh, biasing ourselves towards that because we are only looking at transactions in the very first few uh, weeks in which the website has been launched. And half make multiple transactions. And between, be, among the ones that make multiple transactions, uh, most of them make between uh, two and 10 transactions. Okay, so most of these people are actually using uh, the, the, the Terra as mino, Chai and Terra as mino payment multiple times. Now, just to give you a sense of the importance of discounts, which is an important difference to understand the underlying uh, business plan, uh, if you want to call it, the average spending per transaction is indeed higher for uh, discounted products, which sort of makes sense, right? We are offering some discounts, and you do have uh, uh, average spending that goes up, so there is a reaction to this discount. Is indeed the way in which uh, uh, payment systems are competing against each other. And uh, this is different than looking at transaction by transaction. So transaction by transaction, actually the, the dollar amount, the Korean one value goes down, and that's because there are discounts. But overall, how much money each single user spend on the e-commerce goes up. Okay. And that's already informative of the fact that offering more discount is sort of a successful strategy in attracting more volume. Now, more volume might come from two different uh, uh, sources, one is uh, higher uh, overall volume per user, or you have multiple users, new users that come uh, and adopt uh, this as, a, as their mino payment. And I will show you some results for both. In particular, I want to show you, I want to sort of dig into the chai discounts, not the ones that are offered by the merchants. So this is really the ones that are sort of in our realm of possibilities. And we, we have products that are offered at zero or very low discount, as well as products that are offered with uh, more than 10% uh, discount. And so the question that we would ask is, what is the effect? And is the effect uh, linear or nonlinear? This is sort of one of the standard questions in uh, what's called industrial organization, sort of trying to understand really how the demand reacts to changes in underlying conditions. And so trying to understand a little bit what's the elasticity of these clients. And this elasticity is going to be very different, we would expect to be very different than what you can get in any other uh, e-commerce platform or any other market. And in fact, we have no clue ex ante how these customers would have looked like. And that's why it's sort of it's very nice to see the transaction analyze the data in the first place. So the median level of the discount is about 9%, but as I say, there is quite a bit of variation, and they run promotions uh, all the time. So what we find is that uh, there is a significant increase in spending, but the interesting thing is that this increase is actually nonlinear. So what I did here was uh, looking at total sales by discount level, and differentiating between very low dis zero and very low discount, between zero and five percent, and then looking at between five and nine percent, and then the other two between nine and ten, and ten and hundred percent. Okay, obviously there are no hundred percent. What you see here is that there is a significant jump, and so added the spending volume when you offer a discount between five and nine percent. But then the benefits of offering uh, higher and higher discount sort of disappears. The other thing that we can do is also providing some information about the underlying clients and see whether they react in, in a different way. And the, the thing that is interesting for us is sort of trying to understand who should we target. Can we make this discount a little bit more customizable? Because maybe we have some early adopters that are going to use this no matter what, or maybe we have a bunch of clients that we are not reaching yet, and we would like to offer discounts that are really sort of targeted to their needs. 
And so one thing that uh, I want to show you immediately, which surprised me at the beginning, was that we, we, have, we are very skewed towards female uh, adopters. They are making over 70% of the transactions we analyzed uh, in the first uh, uh, three months. And they are, uh, the average spending, uh, more or less, is similar across gender, although female seems to increase spending uh, more in response to discounts. So they seem to be a little bit more elastic uh, than uh, males. The other thing that uh, I want to show you is in terms of age, which is the other demographic characteristic that we have, is that most of our users are actually uh, over 30 years old. That was also surprising to me. And they spend slightly less per transaction than the younger uh, uh, crowd. The younger crowd instead seems to be more responsive to discount. This might be for many reasons. One might be because obviously they have uh, lower spending power, uh, they are a uh, tighter uh, budget constraint. This is something that we can sort of figure out. Or whether they are buying uh, slightly different products. And that will also be uh, interesting to see. One. Uh, thing that uh, I want to I wanna look at, at the end is how behavior differs between early and late adopters. Right? We, I, I think this is a community where uh, there, is a strong, there are strong beliefs, strong sentiments, and so the ones that uh, sort of adopt uh, a platform like this at the very beginning might, have very dif might exhibit very different behaviors than the ones that uh, sort of uh, uh, get to it uh, later on. And so for this analysis, we split the sample in half, looking at the ones that adopted right away in the first few weeks and the ones that adopted later, and trying to understand whether they, their behavior differ dramatically. So what uh, I'm going to show you here is that uh, the average spending per transaction uh, is similar. Early adopter, adopters uh, spend slightly less, but it's not significantly less. It's not very uh, big of a change. Early adopters react more, though, to the move from very low discount to moderate discount, and less from, from uh, moderate to very high discount. So in some sense, the non-linearity that I was talking about before is even more accentuated for uh, the early adopters than the late adopters. So this also means that uh, their elasticity is significantly different than the ones that I will adopt uh, in the next several months. The one thing that uh, uh, here is also useful sort of to get some numbers uh, here is that 48% of later adopters were one-time one customers over this time period, and only 38% of their adopters uh, were uh, one-time customers. This is more intuitive, uh, meaning that the ones that uh, adopted uh, earliest are the ones that are sticking with uh, this mean of payment uh, for longer, they're using it uh, multiple times, while the ones that come later, uh, also because our time period is short, uh, might have used it uh, most of the times just once. Okay. Now, taking stock of some of uh, these numbers, if I want to get to an estimate of really how reactive uh, these users are, we can talk about 1% uh, increase in chai discount, which is really one of the levers that we can use. It was associated with about 0.3 standard deviation higher, which, you know, this is the usual way of the economist, but uh, just to put in numbers, is equivalent to 34 million uh, Korean won total daily spending. Uh, so it's pretty effective. And we find that 1% uh, increase on the extensive margin is also pretty effective. So the first one, this 34 million uh, uh, Korean one uh, is sort of intensive, so I keep the same users and they react to the higher discount by using the platform more. But do, I, do we attract uh, new users as well? Yes, we attract about 1,500 uh, new users by increasing the discount by just 1%. Okay. So it seems that the competition is pretty fierce, but we are at uh, an advantage with respect to them because we can still attract many customers by increasing slightly the discounts. And uh, it's really the move from no discount to small discounts that makes most of, uh, of uh, the additional customer buying. Okay? This is really sort of one key takeaway that uh, we got from uh, this analysis. Now, what's next? What's exciting uh, in the next few months? So we're launching in Mongolia. I think it will be announced in the next uh, several weeks before uh, the end of the year. And then the next market uh, is Singapore. Uh, these are pretty much uh, set in stone, and by 2021, we are looking to enter in uh, 11 new Asian markets. So, in some sense, after uh, Hong Kong, which uh, already launched uh, recently, we'll continue to expand in the rest of Southeast uh, Asia. This is all about online payments, but I think the great thing of having uh, a let me call it a product that actually works and has been adopted uh, so far is that we can take it also offline. 
And so we are going to launch Chai with uh, CU, the 7-Eleven of Korea, which is the largest convenience store chain. They scan and pay with Chai at more than 14,000 uh, uh, locations. And this also allows us to sort of uh, taking steps towards offline ubiquity by increasing Chai consumer touch points. In some sense, we want to get the, con the users to use Chai in almost all of their transactions. So we need to sort of follow them not only, follow them not only on their e-commerce transaction, but also outside of that. And then the one thing that is also very exciting is allowing some prepaid debit card to be used with the Chai platform because this is also a pretty big market, slightly different than the US. In the US, is mainly unbanked people that use prepaid cards, while in Southeast Asia, sort of, uh, they are widely adopted, and so we are also launching that. Okay. I'm going to conclude here uh, saying that uh, I would love to talk more with you guys uh, uh, later, maybe one-to-one, -one and uh, answering some of the questions that you might have about this. Uh, but I, as an economist, I'm super excited uh, about working more and more on Terra and also you know, finally looking at some of these uh, users and how they behave, which is really, as a behavioral economist, is really what interests me the most. Thank you so much.